Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Cars, and I would like to welcome you to the second in our docent discovery series. Our goal for these virtual enrichment webinars is for you to learn more about our natural and cultural history from experts within and beyond our parks community. Today, we will be returning to Big Basin to learn about plant and animal life in the forest a year and a half after the CZU fire overran the park. <coughs> Before we begin, I would like to share a couple of virtual etiquettes we would like you to observe. If you haven't already been muted, please do so now. If you have a question, please utilize the Q&A button on your screen. We have allowed ourselves enough time to answer your questions, if not real time, at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have a general comment or desire to share a thought with others, go ahead and use the chat function on the screen. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and it will be shared on a link sometime during the next couple of weeks and you'll be able to get a copy of it. Now, Without further ado, let me introduce you to Julie Seidel, who is our host for the evening. Julie? Hi, everybody. It's so great to um, see you in the uh, attendance and to um, talk to you through registrations leading up to this. Uh, we have such a amazing group of volunteers in our district and your compassion and your um, interest, your genuine, genuine interest in Big Basin, you know, in the Redwood Forest uh, since the um, CZU complex fire has um, been really uh, warm. And I'm so glad so many of you have reached out. Um, and now, two years later, the reimagining process uh, is taking, uh, is the reimagining re efforts are in process. And um, I know many of you have questions about the status of the Redwood Forest. Um, how are the plants and the wildlife responding to the world two years after that big event? Um, you might also be fielding a lot of visitor questions throughout the district regarding those parks. And um, tonight, we may not be able to answer all of those questions that you have or that visitors have, but what we do have for you is some panelists who can provide um, really, uh, really fascinating insights into the work that's being done and events that have happened that can tell us more about the status of the redwood forest um, and the plants and the animals in it. Um, we are really, really uh, glad to have our speakers with us tonight. You're going to hear from Sky Biblin in a little while um, and about his research into the vegetation of the um, of the big basin and the old growth and right now i'm going to introduce estrella and estrella bibby has been a volunteer docent at big basin for 19 years and she has been able to add her creativity and her energy and time into many special events at big basin including the wings over the basin annual birding event um, and also the Founders Day melodrama, and uh, she helped countless visitors perfect their ranger apple roasting skills during the annual Missing Arm event. Estrella was inspired to become a park docent after hearing about the plight of the marbled murelet on her very first visit to Big Basin when I met her in 2002. And now she especially enjoys sharing the story of the marble murelet with park visitors and telling about Big Basin's historic connection to this rare bird. She has also just come on board um, as a new interp administrator for the district. So welcome to those ranks. And folks, I hope you enjoy the story that Estrella is going to share with us. Thank you so much, Julie.
How are we doing? Can we see my screen? Today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about marbled murelets and their amazing historic connection to um, our beautiful Big Basin Park, um, as well as my own personal um, experience with um, a very small group of people that got to see a marbled murelet fledge last summer after the fire, um, the summer following the fire. So I have wonderful things for you, lots of pictures and lots of information. So let's get started. Uh, Julie already introduced me very, very well, but I just couldn't resist um, plugging my cute family. So this um, is my son, Anderson, and Jerry, Bibby, my husband. So many of you maybe have run into us in the parks at various times. I have um, loved going um, to different festivals for state parks and talking about marbled murelets um, to uh, park visitors and doing lots of education. So it has been a fantastic um, way for me to connect with park visitors, but also to connect with how to care for the park. So it kind of is a perfect story to lead into that. So let's hear more about this unique bird. Um, marbled murelets are a very small seabird. They're somewhat nondescript. They are going to be um, out in the water there in most of their whole life as far as uh, feeding and sleeping. Uh, they don't come to shore except to breed and when they do that they go all the way into the redwood forest. So they're not, you're not going to find them on the shore and they're going to be out feeding on the small silver kind of fish, the anchovies and that kind of thing. And um, they're about the size of a robin, tiny bit more. And so you will be able to see them from certain places. Now where they're more populated, um, higher up north in their region in British Columbia or Alaska, they're really not too hard to spot because the numbers are more. But even just last summer, um, there were reports that from Pigeon Point Lighthouse um, deck that you were able to spot some out in the water with um, a spotting scope or binoculars. So you can see them in the water, but it's hard. Um, they um, are very fast swimmers and they're very fast, um, they, they fly almost through the water and use their wings um, to propel them through the water very, very quickly. So they're really good at hunting and they're really good at catching those fish that they need. Their range, as you can see, um, Big Basin Redwood State Park is in the very, very southernmost range of their uh, range which goes all the way up to Alaska. So if you can imagine they are very uh, challenged in our area already. So the fire that took place was difficult for them. It was already a very challenged area just being the southernmost part of their range. So uh, up in Alaska and in uh, British Columbia area, they um, are more prevalent and um, therefore their numbers are a little bit higher and they're easier to find. But we are already in a kind of a, a, an area that is challenged for them. They're um, incredibly, this is why I love them, their incredible unique nesting um, plan is that they nest in old growth forests. And a mating pair, a mating pair will often return to that same one branch over and over. Research has shown they're looking for a very particular branch, though. It could be the same one they've used, but they're looking for a branch that's about 12 inches wide at, um, at least. And the branches they're looking for, and you'll see later in my talk, they're looking for a branch that is in an old growth tree that is coming out horizontal and then often will grow straight up again and, and branch out. But that horizontal flat branch up against the base of the tree, they're looking for this little soft moss covered depression where they can lay that one egg a year that they lay. And that one egg a year is only maybe, they don't even lay that every time. It really is dependent on their food source and what is going on with the migration of, of those big schools of fish. So it is, um, it, 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 they get one egg and that's it and that's only sometimes. Um, so they're looking for that old growth tree that is 
about 100, 200 feet up is the branch that they're looking for. These trees would be about 200 years old at least or older to be able to support those big of a branch. Uh, so they're definitely looking for that old growth tree. There, um, when they do find that perfect spot, that mating pair, um, the female will lay the egg in that little depression on top of the moss. Absolutely no nest because they are a web-footed seabird in a forest. So they're not building a nest. They're really looking for nature to supply that for them in that old growth tree really high up. So the mating pair will take turns um, in 24 hour shifts sitting on that egg and the other bird will get a breast. They'll fly all the way back to the ocean where they will feed and sleep and regenerate and then come all the way back in to relieve their mate. Uh, after hatching, um, the, fl the fledgling is on that branch for about 30 days while the parent bird is bringing them those little silver fish to eat every day, usually twice a day. And the chick's only protection is to be very still and quiet, which is a lot <laughs> to ask of a baby bird. Um, here uh, we see an egg in that depression uh, that I was referring to. The lower photo uh, up way up high where um, this branch is that they're looking for, that particular kind of thing. There really is a whole ecosystem going on up there when leaves are falling on those big wide horizontal shaped branches. There is soil that's eventually created up there, even um, different seeds. Um, all kinds of things can grow out of that, um, huckleberries even, and ferns and mosses. So there's kind of a whole ecosystem going on that high up in the canopy that this seabird temporarily becomes a part of and its parents are commuting back and forth. The um, illustration we have here is just sort of explaining the resting cycle of the parent bird coming in and uh, back and forth with that um, little fish to feed them. Um, and the lower picture I wanted to include to talk a little bit about their aerodynamic shape. They are able to take off from the surface of the water by paddling really, really hard with their strong feet and getting lift and taking off. Now, if they were on land, they wouldn't have that ability to paddle and take off. So it's very important that they can take off from the water and they can take off from 100, 200 feet up in the air. And, and drop off of a branch and then fly. Those are the only two ways. So if something interrupts those two ways for either the adult or the chick, they have serious problems getting back to the ocean. And finally, here is what a chick looks like when it hatches out. Uh, it is, uh, has a lot of great camouflage with that fluffy down. They uh, are, able to be very still and quiet. Again, that is their only protection. And eventually um, they will have, the chick does pluck its feathers and I have a slide for that. And in the lower photo, you're seeing the chick in its black and white plumage, which it will have right before it fledges. And you can also see the other uh, parent bird there um, feeding the chick in the illustration. So the parent bird has its breeding plumage, which is a brownish color, which helps it blend in in the ocean in the summertime. And then the black and white is for the winter, but the, the uh, chick is red already has that. Oops, sorry. So it, it, that, that being their breeding uh, technique, <laughs> as it were, um, is, is a, a very challenged one in our modern world, especially us being at the very southernmost part of their region. Uh, they need that old growth forest, which we have not as much left as we used to. Um, so they have been um, on, officially, they are listed as threatened in the Endangered Species Act since 1992. Uh, but however, they are state listed as endangered for California because they are more plentiful, as I mentioned, up north. Um, but where we are here, their numbers are still in decline. So 
the numbers are so low, obviously I've mentioned because of the forest, but one of the really important reasons that their numbers are so low is because of predation. So the corvids, the scrub jays and the stellar jays and, and the ravens and crows even, uh, their favorite snack, if they could get a hold of one of them, would be a merlet egg as well as a chick. So that's where the Crumb Clean campaign comes in and our education of our park visitors. We want to encourage them to keep the park perfectly clean as they found it so that we're not feeding those corvids. And uh, by keeping their populations to what is natural for them, it's really important for these birds that get that one egg a year, maybe, <laughs> and we want that egg to have its very best chance as well as the chick. So um, that park education to, to our park visitors is so um, very vital, which is why I love going around and, and telling people about Merillettes because they have such a compelling story. But there really is something that park visitors can do to help them very directly by even just cleaning up after their picnics in all of our parks because keeping those, those corvid management in all of our parks is, is really important to them. And... Sorry, my picture was covered. So I would love to tell you about Big Basin's connection to the marbled Miralette. And this is so exciting and so important. And it really happened right here in Big Basin, but it was um, a historical connection that is an ortho ornithological discovery. And it happened right here in Big Basin. So back in the winter of 1973 or 74, um, and 74, there was a very heavy snowstorm. And I'm not positive this is the actual photo from that, but based on the cars, it's at least somewhere in there. So you might recognize Park Headquarters building in this photo and also the really heavy snow hanging on some of the branches there. So with that heavy snow, there was a lot of damage up in the trees that needed to be taken care of. And that, uh, that spring, they, uh, the park needed to clean up and make it safe for park visitors. So they hired Davy Tree Company to come in and clean up any of the snags that were hanging up in the tree and made it, uh, might make it unsafe. So um, uh, tree trimmers went up and were just going about their business that spring. And one of them was about to cut a branch when, they when he suddenly noticed this fluffy chick. And he was quite precocious. He even bit at the tip of his saw blade uh, when it was off. He was just using it to nudge him. And he seemed really feisty. So the tree trimmer decided to try to bring this bird down. And when he went to move him and went towards him, he could see that it had webbed feet. And immediately he thought he wasn't a birder, but he'd been to a lot, in up in a lot of trees. And he thought this is something unusual to have at Big Basin. And it turned out that this was a marbled mirrorlet chick. And as of 1974, the nest, um, the location of nesting merlets was still unknown. It was a mystery. It, there had been a little bit of a report of seeing them flying in the forest. And so people were looking in trees and trying to discover a nest. And here they found a bird literally just sitting on a branch, which is exactly where, where they should be. Uh, but nobody knew they were looking for maybe a nest and um, that first bird um, unfortunately did not make it but that branch was actually taken down and um, is is being held at the cal academy of science um, as a really important piece of discovery so the actual branch is is there um, and here is an image i believe is the actual bird um, that was found, that very first chick. So this was a really big deal and a really important ornithological discovery. It was the last nesting bird of North America to be discovered. And, and this is in the 70s, which um, is, is, you know, not too long ago. <laughs> So now I would love to share with you a little bit. I'm not, hopefully I have plenty of time left, but um, I would love to tell you about my own experience of getting to see, um, not my, but I call it my own um, Merlette chick fledged last summer. Uh, 
last summer I was doing work um, for Allison Nelson, who's a, a biologist doing work on hermit thrush studies. And I was up in the park and she uh, told me that a nest had been found by Alex Rinkert um, with the Santa Cruz Bird Club, who was also up doing nesting bird surveys. And it was just so exciting to me. My entire, uh, my entire experience with marble marillettes to that date was just 5 a.m. Uh, dawn surveys at Big Basin um, once in a while. So this was very exciting to me. Uh, the area that the nest was found in was um, a, very familiar to me. It was right near what we all used to call the new bathrooms that were on North Escape Road. And the um, part of the park that the nest was found in uh, had green canopy. And this was incredibly rare. And this is me looking up, taking a picture, looking up at what I've declared as my tree. And if you can stand there and look straight up, there's there's green. And this was really rare, uh, especially back in July um, of last year. So this was very exciting. This was a nine acre green patch that, and just a tiny, tiny fraction of the park that had green canopy um, that uh, was not affected. Now the forest floor below this uh, was affected by fire, but this was a little park that had um, a green canopy. So very special to me to start with. So uh, just for reference, for those of you who are very familiar with the park, um, this is a photo of where the nest tree is with the circle in the center. And if you see um, where the garbage can that is still there and you can kind of see some scraped area, that is where the bathrooms were. And so just to kind of give you reference and then you can kind of make out uh, in the trees there is some uh, forestry equipment um, and that would be the little tiny parking lot that was adjacent to the, the bathrooms. So just to help orient you where this is located. And this is that perfect Merlet branch. Um, it is in a, um, a Douglas fir tree. It's about 125 feet up. There is that really um, unique horizontal branch. And I think that I have um, one more kind of zoomed in. You also can see the top of the tree has been freshly broken. Um, we're conjecturing that that may have happened from trees that were falling. So it's highly likely that this um, may have been a historic um, nest site, meaning it was used in previous years. And because of the fire and because trees um, have come down due to the fire, maybe we got to see it because it was made visible because of all of the trees that came down. I don't know. I think it's fantastic and just such an amazing opportunity. So I uh, was there that day and I got introduced to the team working on it. It turned out to be Steve Singer and Stephanie. And I was so excited to um, just get a first look at a marbled murelette. I was super um, enthusiastic and I wasn't even working on that team. I was again supposed to be doing hermit thrush uh, work. <laughs> and so I sort of wiggled myself in and I got a, my very first look through a scope and I, you know, I looked with my binoculars, but seeing it through a scope was really special. It was so exciting. And my entire view was this. <laughs> It was just a little tiny mound of gray fluff right in the, the crotch of that old growth tree with that horizontal branch. And it was the most delightful little gray mound of fluff I have ever seen. Um, it was extraordinary. It was sitting still and quiet and not moving. And I, I was thrilled. I took several pictures. I took all those pictures of, of the tree because I just couldn't wait to get home and tell my husband, but oh, we weren't allowed to talk about it. We couldn't tell anyone, but I did. I broke my silence and I told my husband about it, of course. And um, so the next day I had to get my husband invited. So <laughs> he came along. So um, of the week that the bird fledged, that was a Tuesday. So Wednesday, I had to get my husband invited. And uh, it was so exciting to get to be there and be a part of the team that was just observing what it was doing each night and waiting for that fledge. So it kind of became something we did for the rest of the week. And, oh, I'm sorry. We have a video and I am supposed to do something to make it better. <laughs> Hold on.
Julie, can you remind me how to get, let's see. The bottom of your bar where you have chat and things like that, there's a more section. Got it. All right. Okay, I, I have, um, okay, are we still able to see the video? I hope so. <laughs> I think this will work. Okay. Yep. The, um, oops. let's see. So the clip that I have for you that's loading um, on uh, Thursday afternoon um, of this amazing week of watching it, uh, Jerry and I were asked to go into the park earlier in the day. So most of the viewing that we were doing was at seven o'clock at night and until dark. And we went in early in the afternoon and we were able to witness this amazing thing. So I had mentioned before the bird plucks out its own feathers when it's about to fledge and getting ready to fledge. So this is just a little clip I happen to get of the bird. Now this is very low quality, but it's of such an extraordinary moment that I hope you'll forgive the low quality. So the bird itself is turning and pulling out those fluffy feathers that you had seen before. And they're actually floating on the wind towards me, which was also really extraordinary. So um, just such an amazing sight, something I never thought that I would see. And thumbs up, Julie, if that's working. Is that working? Okay. Okay. So you can see it pulling out just sort of beakfuls, um, and they're just floating down. Um, just amazing. Let's see. I have to figure out how to get out there. Okay. And, uh, on Thursday night, I, of course, had to get Karen DeMello, my good friend and 20-year uh, docent at Big Basin, invited, and she's real, um, real acquainted with uh, Steve and Stephanie. So uh, we got Karen invited for a Thursday night, which was fantastic. And after seeing the marlette picking out its own feathers, the chick, we really thought maybe it would fledge Thursday night. So Karen was very excited to drive on over. Um, we um, were covered with mosquitoes and um, just it was it was absolutely miserable and absolutely delightful all at the same time. Um, and you can see around us, this is the environment that um, we are in. Um, as you can see, the, the forest floor is just covered with uh, tan, tan oak leaves that that the trees were damaged in the fire. And you can see behind us um, the kind of damage that that. Um, had happened to the forest floor where we were. And again, this is a great photo just to kind of give you some perspective of where we are for the final night on, on Friday night. We set up up on this hill. You can see the scope and it, I didn't indicate where the uh, nest is, but it's back uh, towards where the scope is pointing. And you can see Alex Rinkert in his uh, safety vest there. The whole time we were in the park, we were required to be wearing safety vests and hard hats. Um, it was not um, an area that they had stabilized yet. So there were still falling trees. And even in July, there were still reports of fire here and there. So just to give you a perspective, you can see those um, garbage cans again, kind of in the center right of the photo. And right in front of those is where the uh, bathrooms would have been. So um, here is the, the, um, the bird on Thursday evening, the, the chick, after it has plucked out most of its feathers, and you can see just a little bit on its back there, there's a little pluck that is not uh, plucked out. But we were very excited, but we, we saw how much of the down was still there, so we kind of knew Thursday night it probably was not going to fledge. And so here is our Friday night crew, um, really excited by Friday night. Surely um, it was going to fledge, um, absolutely covered with mosquitoes. And uh, there is Steve Singer behind us and Karen DeMello in the middle and Jerry. Um, we were really excited to be citizen scientists and volunteers to be a part of this amazing historic moment. So by the time um, Thursday and Friday night had come along, we were hardly a known um, 
although though it, we were still keeping it quite a guarded secret by then. Um, of course, uh, Portia Halbert was there with us from state parks um, and even Audubon magazine and a photographer was there and an entire film crew with um, the renowned filmmaker Franz Lanting was there as well. So there was plenty of, of, of very official documentation going on and, and a very exciting, exciting night. So Friday night, um, 22 minutes before the Merlet chick fledged right before our eyes, even in the, in the dark, in the fading light, uh, I happened to get this picture of the adult bird coming in to make one, uh, to give the chick one last feed. So you can make out the silhouette of it kind of on the right of the photo between um, the big branch that goes up and then a little smaller branch. And then I have a little video clip of that as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me tell you about the significance before I, I play you that. Let's um, watch it, Estrella, but okay. maybe um, wrap it up with the video so that they know. can experience that alongside us. And then we'll move on to okay. the next presentation. Wonderful. So the adult bird is just to the right, and you can just make out the fish in its mouth. I have the adult and again, bird. I just want to emphasize, this is a seabird that's webbed footed, that is in the middle of Big Basin, right by those old bathrooms that you guys probably remember. This isn't even in a remote location in the park, um, right near park headquarters. And um, this was the very first fledge that was successful in the park in 30 years and only the first nest that had been found at all in 20 years. So this was a really, really extraordinary thing. Um, we all got to join a very, very small group of people who have ever even seen this before ever, let alone at Big Basin after a, a, a historic fire. So very exciting. And I'm going to end with just one little can get out of this video. Um, I have one little video clip that um, shows the fledge. Last fish for the chick. This is from Lansing's video that he was able to get, and you'll see how dark it really was when we saw this bird In fledge. fading twilight, the chick preens itself. It's hard to see what's happening. But then, without any hesitation, it flies off the nest. That was a remarkable moment. Let's watch it again. Nobody knows how... So thank you for listening. Um, I love marble burlettes and their story and their plight. Um, such a unique bird. So um, feel free to ask questions at the end and I will turn it back over to you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Estrella. And so um, there we have this little glimpse into the story of one species, one individual family, really, and their experience as a little marbled murelet family um, after the fire. And, you know, I think it's going to take time before we have all the information that tells us statistically what that means for Big Basin as a nesting site, what it says about big uh, marbled murelets and their um, opportunities at uh, Big Basin after the fire. But as volunteers, I'm so glad to bring you into that moment and that story. Um, and we're going to like draw it out, make the circle a little bigger as we move on to talk to Sky and get his insights um, from some of the research he's been doing. And Sky is a state park interpreter, uh, my colleague based at Wilder Ranch. And after the uh, 2020 fires, he began research as a part of his master's program through San Jose State University 
with the school's Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. And there he's been studying the influence of prescribed fire on subsequent uh, wildfire vegetation recovery and fuel consumption in our coast redwood forests. Um, so some, some questions have already been coming in. They might get answered in Sky's presentation, but keep feeding us questions uh, about um, the redwood forest and we'll see what we can do for you. Take it away, Sky. All right, let me just get my screen share going. Yeah, so um, thank you, Julie, for that introduction. You covered uh, my mouthful of a thesis title, so I don't have to. So I'm going to just kind of roll right through some of this, but really looking at today the, uh, the resistance and resilience in, in a big basin in the Redwood Forest following the CZU fire. So as Julie had mentioned, I am both a researcher at San Jose State and a park interpreter. And if you don't know me from Wilder Ranch, you might know me from Wilderness Patrol, a little bit of Big Base in RDO, or from maybe my past at Pigeon Point or Anya Nuevo. So uh, maybe I know a lot of the uh, people out there in the audience, but I can't see you. So I'll just hope some of you uh, are seeing a familiar face. All right. So um, as I said, I kind of have to wear those two hats and wanted to put on the Stetson for a minute and kind of take that interpreter's lens um, with my research and think about you know themes and really what's been resonating with me when I've been spending you know, many hours out in the forest in this post-fire landscape. And it's this question of like, what can the forest teach us about coexisting with wildfire as we're living in this um, landscape that's been shaped by fire for millennia, but is now exposed to this new form of wildfire proliferation. Um, I just feel like there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. And something I've been reckoning with as I'm out there in the field is how do I kind of demonstrate this um, to people that aren't even necessarily able to see the redwoods um, after the fire the same way that I've had uh, the opportunity and privilege to be able to. So as we go through the slides, um, just be, I'd like people to be thinking about this, uh, what lessons we can take away uh, for ourselves to be resilient and be resistant to wildfires. Um, so just quickly, what we're going to cover, I'm going to be going over and just an overview of my research and some basic wildfire ecology principles, um, just some observations out from the field, uh, and then back to the idea of those lessons from the forest and get started with that. So um, my research um, comes after many years of work that have been done in Big Basin. Now, um, State Parks in Santa Cruz has actually been at the forefront of prescribed fire and putting fire back on the land um, as that's become a more uh, prominent land management strategy as sort of this alternative to this hundred years we're sort of living it with, with uh, fire suppression in California. So uh, prescribed fires started in Big Basin in 1978 um, and the goals of these uh, low intensity understory prescribed burns have been to uh, reintroduce fire in a managed setting and protect park resources and adjacent private land and to maintain um, forest late serial stages and natural vegetative mosaics. Now the map here shows um, some of these prescribed burns that have happened. And um, my research follows the work of another student um, at San Jose State, his name is David Cowman. And he uh, collected data in 2019 and then published um, with uh, Dr. Will Russell in 2021, his findings. And his uh, research was um, on the influence of prescribed fire um, on, these, uh, on vegetation and these uh, fire or uh, stand dynamics. And then another thing he was looking at is how much fuel was on the ground. So uh, while as devastating as the CZU fire was in many regards, it opened up an opportunity and a unique opportunity uh, for sort of this natural experiment where we have this data that was taken within a year uh, before the CZU fires occurred. And I've been going back and resampling these sites. That's allowed us to um, start to look at um, how much fuel was consumed by remeasuring how much fuel is on the ground and doing a calculation of how much was consumed as a proxy for severity, um, as well as just seeing sort of 
um, whether the intended goals of these prescribed fires actually uh, came to fruition when we're in the face of this large scale wildfire that we experienced in 2020. Um, so my research questions, they're uh, a bit wordy, so I'm gonna, I kind of highlighted the point, main points I wanted to get across, um, but it's this influence. Um, the first question is the influence of prescribed fire on subsequent wildfire um, vegetation recovery. So the way I've measured that is um, in Bolchar height, which is another way of saying how high up the flames burned and scarred the trees. Um, tree survivorship by species, canopy retention, tree regenerations by sprouts and seedlings and understory species composition. Um, now, the, uh, the second question is on the difference in fuel load. I'm not gonna be talking quite as much about that today, but that is an important data I hope to get to um, in the future that can show just how much fuel was consumed by the CZU fires themselves and see if there was a difference in those sites that had prescribed fire application, and if there's any relation to how long ago those prescribed fires occurred. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing mostly on that uh, first question today. Um, my study, I was out in the field in um, summer and fall of 2021, um, collecting data, ended up collecting data from 100 sites, um, 50, in, uh, 50 of those uh, plots actually were from places where there was prescribed burn and 50, were not. The prescribed burns that were sampled um, were from either 1999, 2003, or 2007. And all these calculations were taken in 20 meter diameter plots. Um, and I did my best to resample the locations that Kalman had, uh, had sampled in 2019. Now, I just wanted to kind of give a disclaimer that everything I'm sharing today is preliminary descriptive statistics. Um, none of the data I have collected has been put through the you know, rigor of um, true uh, statistical analysis at this point. Um, but I've been sort of just working with the data to kind of get a, a picture of what might be going on out there. So I just want to make sure no one uh, goes too far with reading into the results I have this, thus far. And several months down the line, I might have a little more confidence in what we'll be talking about, but I wanted to share it nonetheless. So um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some just sort of basic wildfire ecology principles. And partially this is because uh, prior to uh, entering into a fire ecology graduate program, I realized I had a lot of misconceptions about fire and landscape. And even as a park employee, I had some of these misconceptions. So the first thing I want, uh, first term I wanted to put out there is fire dependent. And this is really that need for fire and landscape requires it to survive, to propagate. Um, the second term is fire adapted. And so these are uh, landscapes or species that are well adapted to fire. They coexist with fire, but maybe they don't, they don't uh, essentially require it um, to survive. Now, the third term is resistance. And this is sort of the walls, the defense against fire. And the final term is resilience. And that's that post-fire uh, regeneration, how things come back. All right. So that first term fire dependence, um, I just want to touch on this because I had actually been under um, the idea for a while um, and the misconception that redwoods were sort of this fire dependent species. Um, and we have fire dependent species out there like giant sequoias, um, different pines, um, that term serotonous requiring fire for those seeds to germinate. Um, but when we're looking at big basin, we're looking at the coast redwood forest, they do really well with fire, but um, even in the absence of fire, they also can um, do quite well. They can uh, propagate and they don't require it. So that's why I would put um, this, this landscape more into the fire adaptive um, area. So um, fire adaptive, you know, and we think about redwoods specifically, they're fire adaptive because they have this comparative ab advantage against other species. It's not that they need fire, it's that when fire occurs, they tend to do better than the other species around them. So with fire suppression uh, and the absence of fire, we can have the encroachment of other species um, into a coast redwood forest, but above all else, uh, redwoods have just shown themselves to be just persistent and resilient really in a number of environmental conditions, which in our current state of a changing climate, um, doesn't mean that they're immune, but does offer some hope. But um, 
of course they're not immune to everything and severe wildfire it some is something that can can certainly affect them so um yeah, next I wanted to transition into talking about um, resistance in the redwood forest. So uh, when we talk about resistance, we'll think about some strategies that tree species might have to uh, put up those walls to prevent themselves from burning in a fire. Um, well, you know, the first thing if you walk into Big Basin that you'll be taken probably back by is the sheer height of these trees. And that goes for particularly, you know, coast redwoods and Douglas fir, that these are incredibly tall trees and that those high canopies can keep those the canopy um, protected from smaller um, understory burns. However, um, fires uh, can still get into the crown. So um, the other thing they might have is like, you know, thick bark or deep roots um, are strategies to survive wildfire um, or maybe tannins. Um, there's a number of them. So we'll be looking at some of those today. So, okay, we're gonna first, for the first time, jump into some of the study itself. Um, so using what is called a laser range finder, um, I was out in the field collecting data on the, both the height of the tree, and once again, that idea of that bowl chart height, which is just how high up the fire scarred. Now that fire scarring, um, can be a proxy measure for fire severity on its own, doesn't necessarily tell us, uh, but combined with other factors like fuel consumption, or maybe some, um, aerial imagery, uh, we might get some idea along with maybe canopy retention to understand um, how a forest was a, how severe a fire was in the forest. Now, um, while I was out there um, in the field, I collected um, data on all trees that had at least 50% of their basal area um, within the plot. Now that came out to 403 redwoods, 107 dug fir and 459 tan oak. So um, all of the tree specific data I'll be presenting in this presentation is all off of those numbers. Now I did sample um, some madrone and some um, oaks as well, uh, but there wasn't a high enough number really to put into any statistical models. So I've omitted that at this point. Um, so when we're looking at resisting fire with height, we see that you know these trees are incredibly tall, right? We see redwoods. These are the actual me the median heights of all the trees sampled is in the orange here, and so it shows just how tall these trees are. Um, and and this is in meters, so we're talking well over hundred feet tall. It's just the average, and um, but you'll see that actually the uh, the fire um, was quite high as well. Um, and the maximum um, height I had found for a tree was of a redwood, and that was about it was 72.8 meters, which is about 240 feet. But what the max flame height found was 68 meters. So um, incredible to think about these flames that were burning through this forest were some well over 200 feet tall. So that just puts a little perspective when we're thinking about, well, how effective was these small understory burns from maybe 10, 15 years ago, it's hard when you're up against blazes like that. It's just a, maybe a different scale of force, but you might be surprised by some of the results we do find. So um, another um, sort of proxy for that fire severity is canopy retention. So how much of the crown was retained in the fire? And certainly I've, I've heard a lot in, in news and things about the CZU fire of sort of this mass devastation. Um, and while that's certainly true in many regards and fire did affect a large amount of the forest. It affected 97, I believe, percent of the forest. What we find is that doesn't mean every tree burned and you actually can find these patches and Australia was able to share one of those little refuge um, areas. But really as the more I spent time out in the field, the more I found there really was this um, diversity in burn severity and sort of that mosaic that we hope to see in a redwood um, burn area. Um, to measure canopy retention, I was um, using a tool, it's called a spherical densiometer, you can see it here. And it's really just a mirror with 24 grids um, and allows you to just count how much open space there is above. Now, this counts both live and dead branches. Um, and you might wonder why would we be counting dead branches? But when we're talking about um, canopy cover, what, what, what could be important here is how much light is reaching um, the forest floor. One of the reasons when we talk about serotonous um, cones, the reason they wait for that heat is because they know that the, the competition has been removed around, that the canopy has been opened, that sunlight will reach the uh, forest floor. 
But um, so it doesn't really matter whether the, the sun is being blocked by something that's green or something um, that's maybe dead and brown. So um, next I can show you a little bit of the numbers found about um, for canopy cover. So um, interesting to see here, and once again, just preliminary uh, numbers, but that we had almost 85% uh, canopy cover in prescribed burn areas and about 79% in areas without a prescribed fire. So important both that there's this difference between the prescribed fire and no prescribed fire. Also just um, important to see that, you know, even though um, a lot of that green vegetation was removed, um, the understory species, herbaceous species that grow at the can um, on the uh, forest floor still have that shade and it maybe hasn't changed the composition um, as much as maybe we would think when we think about a fire of this severity. So um, another um, next thing I wanted to get into is sort of now moving in. Yeah, so we're talking about still about this idea of uh, resistance, who stood up against the fire. And um, here we are with some numbers here. And I want to make very clear, this is short-term response, that trees can show mortality several years after a fire. And these, uh, this is all taken about a year to a year and a half after the fire. Um, so you'll see there's not too much difference between um, areas where there was prescribed burn and wasn't prescribed burn in this term. Now, you'll see I also have two different uh, measurements of, uh, of uh, mortality. And actually, before I get to that, notice I, I called it tree survivorship. Usually you'll see these numbers in terms of mortality, but I decided to flip those numbers and call it tree survivorship because that's just, uh, let's, let's look at how many survive, not how many died. Just a little more positive message here, I'm hoping. Uh, but the same idea is there. So, uh, but why is there these two numbers? And the reason is I'm uh, assessing each tree's mortality based on two metrics. Now, um, the first one is uh, sort of this one that's grounded in ecology and genetics. And it's that if a tree is presenting green from the base or anywhere, then that tree is alive. If it is regenerating, it's alive. And we think about that particularly with clonal trees, like when we think about redwoods. Now, uh, a tree can be burned to the ground, but still have sprouts and therefore is alive. So what we see here is with tan oak, redwood, we have almost 100% survivorship. And I think that might be a big surprise to a lot of people um, watching this today, which is that, you know, even though a lot of these trees were burned, the tree itself genetically identical survives and persists. And that is true, true um, resistance or really resilience as it comes back. Now, um, the industry, as I've put here, is well, that, that metric isn't really very useful if you are a forester or in there doing salvage logging. If I go in and say that this tree that's burned almost to the ground is alive, that's not very much, very useful to someone who is in there trying to decide which trees to cut and which trees to leave. So the other metric is more this forestry or uh, maybe like logging type of definition that would assess the tree based off of if there's any green on the standing bole. So the standing tree, not necessarily just coming out of the ground. Now you'll see the only place where there's no discrepancy here is for Douglas fir, and that's because they don't uh, reproduce by basal sprouting. Um, one thing really cool to see here is I think the tan oaks. The tan oaks almost have this 100%, um, near 100% survivorship um, from that genetic standpoint. So almost they're, they're almost always kill, like there's nothing living on the tree that's standing, yet they still have basal sprouts. All right, so that, you know, now we're moving more to this idea of resilience of how things regenerate after the fire. Um, so we're really thinking here mostly about basal sprouts and um, the other thing to think about would be, um, would be seedling, seedling recruitment after a fire. So um, we can see resilience in the form of basal sprouts for redwoods. We see it for tan oaks. We even see it for Douglas fir, um, who has seedling, um, seedling dispersal post-fire. This has been an area of concern, I think, by a lot of people um, who know this forest and um, are concerned, rightfully so, that with um, the way that Douglas firs uh, reproduce, that they need to retain canopy to be able to spread um, their, their to, to reproduce. And um, I will say, well, I haven't, I can't actually, you know, say the numbers uh, are sound that they will come back. I anecdotally can say I did find 
a quite a large number of seedlings of Douglas fir in the forest. Sky, um, I'm just going to take a moment to say that I notice we're coming to the end of our typically scheduled time. If our um, audience members, if some of you need to leave, I totally understand. If you can stay on, please hang out with us for um, the presentation and the questions and answer at the end. And if you need to leave, know that we will be recording this and be able to offer that to you in the future. Thank you. Continue, Sky. All right. Yeah, I'll do my best to wrap things up, but I still got a few more figures to show. Let's see. So um, here, looking at the number of redwood basil sprouts, um, these numbers kind of just blow me away to think about uh, maybe how mind numbing some of the research out there was. Like, it's a very wonderful experience being out there. But uh, having counted 21,000 sprouts, basil sprouts in um, prescribed fire areas and um, almost 17,000 in the areas without prescribed fire treatment. So um, I believe this speaks to two things. One, that there's you know this incredibly vigorous regrowth from basal reproduction post-fire for redwoods. Um, and that actually we saw quite a notable difference between the sites with treatment and without. And I'm going to be very interested to see what happens when these go through the proper statistical analysis. <clears throat> So um, the next one I wanted to talk about is now we're looking at seedlings and just redwood seedlings. And uh, you know, I, I have collected data on much more than this. I'm just sharing you know, just uh, some preliminary data um, just and also in the sake of time. Uh, but if anyone's interested in the future, if you wanna hear more about the other species or anything, I'm happy to answer questions um, as it pertains to my data. Um, but here we can see that uh, plots with redwood seedlings um, were primarily, and this is just a presence of whether at least one redwood seedling was found in the plot, um, that 73% of the plots that had redwood seedlings were actually in prescribed fire sites. So um, another interesting trend there that will be interesting to investigate at a later point. Okay, so now I'm uh, getting to the part of the presentation I was uh, hoping I'd have time to get into, which is just the sort of fun observations I had out in the field, interesting things that I didn't expect to see after spending just hundreds of hours out there um, in the forest that were really some remarkable things to witness. Um, so here you can see this um, new albino uh, redwood sprouting out, um, which was really incredible to see. And I was lucky enough to be out there with some uh, big basin docents who were able to share that moment with me. Um, and then um, to the right, you can see these, uh, this field really of redwood seedlings and uh, redwoods, coast redwoods are known for a, um, for post fire regeneration being at least in this range, predominantly almost you know entirely basal reproduction, which makes sense. It requires less energy to just shoot out a clone of yourself than it does to start from a seed. Um, but what we found, found here is in one plot alone um, that there were over 4,000 redwood seedlings. Now, of course, these all can't survive because trying to imagine 4,000 redwood trees um, in what was a 20 meter diameter plot, it's simply impossible. Um, but they are trying that recruitment strategy. And um, it's something that's fairly unique to see here, not unheard of, but um, is definitely a surprise. Um, a couple other things. Uh, now, uh, I have actually prior to the fire had not spent a ton of time in Big Basin, but um, I never thought of, at least in the forest floor areas or, you know, kind of lower elevations to thinking of a lot of knob cone pines, but that seedling that's there is actually a knob cone pine. And I saw a very large number of knob cone pines and they, um, they're one of those species that kind of wait for that, uh, you know, they do well post fire, but they also, they tend to grow on ridge tops if you think about where you see knob cone pines. So um, that was one something I was just like thinking about, like, why am I seeing so many knob cone pines? And often it's because I was on trails. So these are flat areas, which make it seem like it's a ridge top. And also um, the canopy is more open, river not totally open, but much more open than it would be. So um, I think a lot of these seedlings are under the impression that they actually are a uh, on the top of a ridge when they're not. Now um, here I've got a madrone and I just wanted to share that because a cool experience for me. I don't know if any of you went, you know, if any nature camp or anything like that, you did the refrigerator tree, you put your hand on the madrone and it's cool to the touch even if it 
taught out. Well, this does not um, stand up to be true once that um, tree has burned. You can see this tree is dead by the measure of uh, the forester and alive by the ecologist, right? Because it's got that basal sprouting. But what's happened here, the reason that's cool to the touch usually is because you put your hand there and it's transporting water in the cambium layer, cambium layer, and that's really close to um, the surface on that tree and that's what happens. But when that cambium layer has been choked out and it's no longer transporting water, that effect um, is no longer in play. All right, so um, I wanted to share this. This is um, a little, you can see actually that image is going there. So um, something I did not expect to see was how long the fires were burning, you know, so uh, that we had these reburns and that actually got in the way of some of my data that some of these areas burned a second time, but it's from that initial source. And also what we have here is, um, I'm not sure if it's coming in very well, but you can see in that September, so a whole year after the fire, there's some little embers yeah. burning. I actually found a residual uh, fire um, that had been smoldering and was continuing to burn. This is after a year, a year after the fire. So uh, just a little bit alarming for me, a kind of emotional moment to see this and realize that what this sort of means is that one fire season now becomes a risk into a next fire season that we can see that multi-year fires um, as a possibility. We definitely have. Um, then the other thing I wanted to share, and I'm gonna wrap this up, um, just the amazing wildlife that found refuge in this area. Um, that a lot, you know, we found, uh, found, sal or found slugs, found fish, turret spiders, uh, deer, uh, western fence lizard, all in, um, pretty quickly in this post-fire environment. Now, I just wanted to end with, um, you know, started with that, I, um, that slide near the beginning where I was asking, well, what are the lessons from the forest on coexisting with wildfires? Hoping all of you would think about that. And I just wanted to share what sort of, uh, what's been resonating with me on that, on that question. It's that fire is not a war to fight. It is a force to live with. That as humans, we're sort of alone in this idea of trying to fight and suppress fire. And that you look around the forest and there's all these species, plant and animal that have co-evolved and found ways to resist and to be resilient to fire. Um, but that we're sort of unique in this um, strategy of trying to fight fire. And maybe there's some lessons to be learned from those other species. So um, that is all I had. I'm hoping maybe some of you already had a passion for either Big Basin or fire, uh, wildfire ecology, uh, or maybe at least one of you uh, got, has have sparked some interest today. Um, but if you um, have any interest, we are in the process of bringing back Big Basin um, to the public. And that's going to be happening um, this summer. So if you're interested in volunteering um, and you're a volunteer at another park, we're going to be trying to put together a training for volunteers um, to get enough experience and uh, fire ecology training to get out in the field and join us in the forest. And I'll be uh, working with some other uh, wonderful people on team to uh, put together that training and get people out there and reopen this really wonderful and cherished place to the public. Um, so there should be a link in um, the chat that you can actually fill out a application if you're interested. And that is all. And I'm sorry, I'm a couple minutes over, but hopefully not too bad. And I'm going to stop my share now. Thank you all very much. Hey, Sky. Uh, yes. There is a question here uh, from Kathy Le Letham. Uh, right. How often did a redwood forest have a fire before we start putting fires out? Yeah, so that's a really good question. It's a really hard question to answer. So um, a lot of uh, landscape forest or landscapes, we can have this idea of what the fire return interval, we call it, was off of landscape. And you think about places like the coastal prairie, Onganuevo, Coroste Valley, there's this really clear record and that's through charcoal analysis. Uh, that's um, through something called phytolith analysis. It can be an archeological record. It can be through oral history um, of indigenous people. It can be even from documentary history of the Spanish who were great journal, uh, or great at journaling what they saw. Um, now, the best understanding we have is that really in the coast redwood forest, we've there's been studies published all over the place that have found the fire return interval ranging from six years, I believe it was like to 140 or something ridiculous. It was some of this wide range. And um, really, you know, what we found, I think, is that likely is that people were purposely starting fires in adjacent landscapes and that those fires were escaping into the redwood forest. Now, the indigenous people that were living in the Santa Cruz area were not primarily living actually under the redwoods. They were living in more productive landscapes like grasslands, oak woodlands. And those were the areas they were actively um, putting fire on the land. Now, um, those fires may have escaped into the redwoods. 
So uh, there could have been, so that would explain why there was actually a higher fire return interval, we think, in forests when there have been people living in this area. So sorry, that was a long-winded answer to that question because it's kind of a hard question, um, but hopefully that offers some insight to that. And we will um, continue to answer questions. I understand if people have to leave, but you can catch the end of this or any answers on uh, the recorded video eventually. Hey, um, Sky, a, a question came into the chat and it actually contains um, a word I don't know. So Howard's asking, how have the heth adapted to burn loss of understory? H-E-T-H. -H. He says, huckleberry food source. I've been stumped. I, he's, I think he's referring to the hermit thrush. That's the, the abbreviation for hermit thrush. A birder knows. There we go. <laughs> Estrella, um, what have you found out from Amber, uh, Ashley? Al Allison, Allison. Allison uh, in the bird Allison, study. Yes, um, I, all I can speak to, I, I cannot speak to her findings. She is a biologist that is continuing her research. So I don't want to speak to any formal findings, but I can uh, speak to what my job there in helping her was that we were looking for active nests um, in the post fire, the first season after the fire. Uh, so this was um, from about May to July-ish um, that we that I was doing this work. And um, the challenge for the hermit thrush at that time uh, was that the um, tan oak uh, was offering the only understory coverage for the hermit thrush to nest in. And they would normally nest in huckleberries, which were gone. They might nest, um, even try to nest in the um, sprouts of, that had been there for a long time. But all the sprouts were very fresh and really new and tender and would fall over if they tried to build a nest in there. So these giant um, tan oak leaf clumps hanging from the, the um, you know, part of the tree that had died was really the only place for them to to hide enough to make it you know and they're such secretive birds to start with so um, this was a very challenged bird last summer so um, i can only really speak to our experience with that but their nesting habitat was really non-existent and they were being very creative and trying to use these tan oak uh, leaves that were hanging in clumps and uh, so my job was to help allison find any nesting habitats or nesting behavior and able to um, kind of keep those marked off and allow um, these nests to try to proceed even within that, that fire zone. Thanks, Estrella. And I uh, thank you. Ashley has dropped the um, links into the chat so that if you're interested in um, pursuing the Big Basin volunteer opportunity, you can reach that website. And then if you wanna find out more about the process for reimagining Big Basin, the chat is also in, um, has the link there. Thanks a lot. Australia, Thanks. there was another question here from uh, Patrick O'Rourke. Uh, do Mar uh, Merlin's mate for life? Uh, I believe that that is true. They do stay as a mating pair. Um, it's not always that that pair can stay together for one reason or another, however. Um, so I do believe that they come back together, but um, uh, I know that they reuse branches, so they must reuse mates as well. <laughs> Guy, I was wondering about what you said about knob cones, and aren't the cones serotonous? That's my understanding, yeah. Um, so that would, you know, partially explain why seeing a lot of them and not used to seeing as many in the environment. Um, but still, you know, seeing them in like kind of these like low elevation creek bed areas, like where you really never see these trees sort of interesting to see. So, um, and that was, yeah, so I guess uh, that would explain it in part. And then I have just my own little like speculative theory of we've, they've been fooled into thinking they're on top of a ridge and where they usually would grow because I'm walking along trails and it's flat and it's open. Yeah. Are your um, um, maps uh, available? 
Um, let's see, burn history map. Oh, the prescribed burn history map. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to share it. That was generated by, let's see, David Kalman. I don't think that'd be an issue. I'd be happy to, to share that. Yeah. Very good. Um, we could share it through the registration link for the, um, for the webinars. Okay. All right, if there's no other questions, then again, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening uh, and want to remind you that you should be receiving, that you'll be uh, receiving a link uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks uh, of the recording of this presentation. Uh, additionally, I'd like to invite you to our third and our last seminar that will be held on Tuesday, April 26, titled Guiding Light Since 1872. This webinar is gonna focus on the 150 year old Pigeon Point Lighthouse with interpreters Joe Rogers and Julie Barrow sharing the site's history, restoration updates, and an understanding of the tools and skills used in 19th century navigations. Until then, I'd like to say thank you again and take care. Julie, did you have anything else to add? Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sky. Thank you, Australia. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, all the volunteers and staff who showed up. Um, we love you all and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night. <laughs>